In this episode, I had a fantastic conversation with Anil, a fellow Bitcoin educator and is among the only 20 Bitcoiners I regularly read on Twitter. We discuss his amazing Twitter threads, his mini books that he's published on Bitcoin, his current project on mental models and Bitcoin, his views on Bitcoin versus altcoins and lots more. I really enjoyed this conversation with Anil and I hope you do too. Hi Anil, uh, thanks for coming on Sunny Bitcoin. Thanks for having me, Sunny. Uh, really excited to, to chat more about Bitcoin to you. So Anil, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got involved with crypto. So, um, geez, where to begin? I guess the, the, the common element, which probably makes the most sense, is uh, I've lived in a number of different countries. And if you've ever had to deal with the bureaucracy around transferring uh, value or assets between countries, you know that the traditional banking system probably um, could be a bit more frictionless. So. For me, uh, it just so happened that I stumbled, I guess, or was introduced to, to Bitcoin or the concept of it while I was undergoing one of those transitions, uh, that time from Australia to Canada, where I am now. Um, so it was just kind of the timing of it, uh, where a solution sort of is presented to you and it just makes sense to be a bit curious and see if there's merit. So that kind of set me off on my journey. So which year was this? Can you give us more specific details? What was the exact uh, problem and then how Bitcoin solved it for you? So yeah, I, I tend not to talk about, you know, the year. Um, and I, I tend not to talk about, you know, uh, my own holdings. And that's okay. not because I'm like some whale, but it's more I encourage others to also not talk about those things <laughs> just from okay. a, an OPSEC uh, point right. of view. But it was um, at a time when people were still skeptical about Bitcoin. That the right. only things you really heard about it was it's for criminals, it's for pornographers. The only reason you would want to use it is if you have something to hide. You know, all those same arguments I'm sure you've heard and are still hearing today. So usually, um, I guess the history of technology is littered with this exact same story. The same yes. thing happened when mobile phones first came out. No one will ever use them. Why, why would you, you know, need to? They're, they're too big, they're too expensive, they're too slow. And obviously with time, things scale and get better and improve and get debugged. And then we saw the internet come along and the same arguments were thrown uh, at the internet. Uh, and now we're seeing the exact same thing play out with Bitcoin. So uh, it just it's just pattern recognition that if most people, um, including newspaper headlines, are very skeptical about a new technology, it's probably worth looking into. Yeah, and even with so more fundamental technologies, right? Like electricity and cars also have gone through the same journey, actually. Yeah. 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 It's, it's... And so what's your background professionally or uh, academically that you, uh, you know, it's just to give the audience a bit of a context. So I actually started in the music industry. That's where I began my career on the um, live side of it. So the touring side where you have these big, uh, you know, gargantuan uh, operations that roll into town and move from city to city to city. And you, you know, it, it feels like you're running a small city each night when you're, when you're touring with large um, artists and bands. So um, yeah, that was a really good insight for me because I got into that industry around the same time that uh, streaming services and MP3s were taking market share away away from physical records and CDs. So artists were being forced to tour. Whether they wanted to or not, that was how they would have to make money. So working in the touring industry, I was very fortunate that it was just a boom time for us because everyone had to tour to make money. The revenue model had flipped. Um, so that was a, a, a good um, wake up call for me to sort of understand the process of creative destruction, that nothing is forever things will change. And if you can understand when you're at that inflection point, it can often be you know, a good opportunity to, to move into an industry that's undergoing that. Um, and you know, seeing music get touched by the digital transformation, uh, online commerce, 
you know, there are only a few left that haven't. So there's a good chance they will undergo that, you know, being, say, education, one of them, and, and obviously finance, which, you know, we find ourselves in that sector. So, yeah, it's just an area that's ripe for disruption. And uh, that's usually where a lot of opportunity is. So you've combined uh, education and finance and Bitcoin. And so how did you reach this kind of stage? Because you are a Bitcoin educator. Yeah. So yeah. tell us a little bit about um, your journey towards becoming a Bitcoin educator and a Bitcoin sure. influencer. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, I left the music industry once I felt that there was not maybe that much more to learn um, and went back to university to do an MBA. And it just happened to be around the time when I was first being introduced to Bitcoin, while at the same time, um, you know, studying uh, innovation and finance and accounting, and you're kind of being handed all these different puzzle pieces uh, while, you know, Bitcoin's kind of happening in the background. So it's just a very ideal timing that, um, yeah, I was, I was, you know, studying the exact same pieces that make up Bitcoin. So I was maybe very fortunate that, yeah, I was in, in a place where I was likely to maybe understand it. And again, you know, at the time, most of the Bitcoin content was in English. So, you know, you know, native English speakers have had a bit of a, a bit of luck there. Um, yeah, so uh, wrapped up school, uh, went to work at a, a startup, went to work in the public sector and just kept getting you know, a little tap on the shoulder from the Bitcoin ecosystem saying, hey, we're still here. It's still happening. It's growing. There's interesting and exciting things happening. And at some point it just became, you know, too irresistible. It was just too exciting not to be, become a part of it. So I tried to fill the gap that I thought was there, which was the fact that Bitcoin does a really good job at making people feel really dumb. Um, and I I went through that. I don't know if you did. <laughs> you, you seem a pretty sharp study, so maybe you didn't have that experience. But um, yeah, I, I didn't want others to, to maybe go through that same um, hardship of feeling like an idiot, but I can't understand this because, you know, you can. And if anyone's listening who feels intimidated by Bitcoin, it is understandable. Just find the right teachers who explain it in a particular way that you connect with. So that's kind of what I tried to do was fill, fill a gap for some people like me. Yeah, I was lucky because I had my tech co-founder, uh, you know, from the beginning. So for me, the learning curve was extremely, uh, uh, you know, short. And I think my attempt with Sunny Bitcoin, and I think that's what you're trying to do, is become my co-founder, Mahi, and two other people who want to understand Bitcoin. You know? So absolutely, I agree. So on your Gumroad profile page, Anil, you've mentioned that you are an independent Bitcoin educator and launched the first Bitcoin specific university scholarship in Canada. Tell us a little bit more about this. Um, that was, yeah, the result of, I don't know if you know many MBAs, but they tend to be pretty risk averse. Uh, you know, maybe they'll go and work for a, a startup or so, but they, they usually shy away from things that are new or untested or gray areas. You know, you kind of want that safe middle management job at a big consulting firm. So uh, I was at, in a position where um, I was working with the university at the time where uh, there was, yeah, the opportunity basically to launch a scholarship to attract Bitcoiners. I, I wanted more Bitcoiners in the classrooms, in the MBA classrooms, because then others will, um, you know, maybe just brush off and learn a little bit about it. Because if you believe it's inevitable, which I, I personally do, the sooner you can be exposed to some of the concepts in Bitcoin, the, the more likely you're not going to brush it off in the future to your own detriment. So yeah, launching that scholarship was really just a product of wanting more Bitcoiners um, in a MBA classroom, which probably is not the most, uh, I don't know, normal setting, should we say, for, for a Bitcoiner. So how was the response from the university? They accepted your proposal and it was successful very easily or they were skeptical? Um, no, usually if you want to give a university money, they will happily take it. So there wasn't much pushback. Um, and no, to be, to be fair, you know, universities understand that they need to be fairly forward thinking um, and that they always need to be on the edge 
of new fields. And it was by this point pretty obvious that there was merit to Bitcoin. You know, some of the big announcements had been made where it had gained enough legitimacy that it, you know a university's reputation would be damaged by being associated with with Bitcoin. So yeah, it was maybe past that hurdle point by then. Who was sponsoring the scholarships? It was it was you. So it was yeah me in um, uh, in the early days, and I've been trying to uh, essentially bring together a group of other uh, I guess notable Bitcoiners to then perhaps support carried on the future. That's a great idea. I mean, we've heard of uh, Bitcoiners supporting, of course, uh, core developers, which is absolutely a noble thing to do. But this is a very interesting concept as well uh, to kind of, um, you know, get Bitcoiners in the uh, to provide scholarships to them. But probably if they are Bitcoiners, they might not need scholarships over a longer period of time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that's the tricky thing is, is something that I've maybe found fairly surprising. You know, if you go to enough Bitcoin conferences. You, you, you run into people who are maybe prolific Bitcoiners who you would assume would be, uh, I don't know, maybe considerably wealthy or well off, but you maybe you come to realize that it actually takes a lot more to get, you know, to hold through several successive bear markets, cover your living expenses, support a family. Um, and then also a number of Bitcoiners aren't really interested in the financial upside. They're more interested in maybe the ideological side of, you know, uh, offering a more fair uh, financial and monetary system. Totally agree. Um, and Anil, uh, tell us a bit about the Bitcoin books that you've published. So yeah, it, start, it started as uh, Twitter threads, essentially. You know, I was getting maybe like you, you know, bull markets come around and you get inundated with questions from a wide range of people. So how can you put together resources that satisfy all those needs uh, save yourself time, you know, during probably a pretty busy work period. And uh, so I just started putting together these threads um, and then threads turned into small books and then the small books would turn into lectures and then the lectures, uh, you know, would turn into something else. And at, at one point I kind of condensed, tried to condense everything I'd put out up until pretty much this point into one uh, concise book, um, which you know, it's been, I've been yeah, really surprised by the reception um, from it. It kind of just goes to show that Bitcoiners are just keenly focused on uh, constantly updating their models. You know, they want to see where the gaps in their logic are. Because at this point, um, I definitely felt this way, is that anything interesting, unique or helpful that could be said about Bitcoin had already been said, you know, <laughs> there, there are definitely people who had already kind of covered that, that, that stuff in way more eloquent language or better visuals or, uh, you know, more entertaining talks. But uh, yeah, it's kind of not the case, you know, as we're seeing today, that there's just, there's so much room and there's so many different angles to attack this beast from that, um, you know, if you, if you have the, uh, I guess, creativity and drive, you know, Bitcoiners will support you. If, if, your, if your goal is noble and just trying to educate people, you, you will be surprised by the, the support of the community. And then that just, again, gives me confidence into the future of the network. So it's just this constant flywheel. No, absolutely. You have some fantastic uh, Twitter threads. And just uh, like I was telling you before we started recording, I, of course, follow a lot of uh, you know Bitcoiners on Twitter. But then there is a very small list of Bitcoiners. Literally, I think there are 18 um, a bit, a Bitcoiners uh, whom I'll read on a daily basis. And uh, you are on that list. So it's not like it's a privileged list, but you are one of my favorite um, Bitcoiners or the one of the very few Bitcoiners whom I read regularly. And there are some fantastic Twitter threads. And I'm going to uh, put a link uh, to those Twitter threads because, uh, um, uh, you know, in the description below. So for the audience and uh, I read the book, uh, The Use Cases of Bitcoin, which is, by the way, a free book. Uh, and I love that you've made a mini book, which literally takes just a few minutes to read with amazing graphics. I bought the other two books, Understanding Bitcoin with Mental Models. And if you understand this, a visual guide to Bitcoin, unfortunately, I made a typo in the email. So hopefully you'll sort me out with the PDFs and I yeah. can read that. <laughs> um, but that, that's fantastic. Tell me a little bit about the lectures that you give, that you mentioned. Yes. Yeah, so I guess it's, it's building... Uh, content that can be used uh, multiple different ways. 
So if something can be used as a standalone Twitter thread, um, usually everything will be in the format of uh, landscape slides. If, if you've kind of seen any of my books or work, because um, what I find is, and I, I don't mind this, you know, I'm not complaining, uh, is uh, my work gets stolen a lot. Um, I'll, I'll see it in different publications or someone else on Twitter will, you know, maybe take credit for it and pretend it's theirs. Or, um, you know, it, it might show up in a, a YouTube talk that someone else is giving. And to me, that's like, uh, yeah, quite humbling because it means, okay, this was actually effective. It did its job, you know, and I really want to try to remove my own ego as much as I can out of any content. Because the goal is if someone doesn't walk away having a better or deeper or, you know, more precise understanding of Bitcoin, then I failed. Um, and that's what's great about Twitter is because people aren't shy about giving you feedback, you know, very blunt feedback too. So if you can use that um, constructively, uh, it's an incredible opportunity to just really fine tune uh, educational material to, to a, a point where just a lot of people will get it, um, which maybe is not the case for a traditional, say, academic textbook, which gets published once a year. The person publishing it maybe isn't actually even teaching that material. So, yeah, I do like to put content out and then try to teach it live as well to get that feedback. Um, and then you just, you're just constantly refining it. So, and I, I think a lot of Bitcoiners do that. And we're at a point now where we just have such fantastic material, whether it's blogs or uh, animated videos or live lectures um, or infographics. You know, we've got that arsenal of material now. For, for the, at least this this cycle onwards, when those naysayers or haters kind of say, "Oh, it's boiling the oceans. That's only for criminals," you know, we have the tools now to kind of say, "Hey, <laughs> that's incorrect. Educate yourself um, and and kind of fight back a bit." Yeah, I totally agree. And a lot of memes as well. Much better memes this cycle. <laughs> I, I, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> I absolutely yeah. agree. In the previous price cycle, there was absolutely no information, even like the price analysis, the tools that have been built over the last uh, three, four years are just astounding. And what's the typical audience for the lectures that you give? It varies a lot. Um, it kind of started just doing guest lectures at uh, for, for universities, usually business specific um, school students. But um, it, it sort of branches out from there. And then now, you know, between, say, podcasts or more um, informal talks to, to groups of just interested Bitcoiners, uh, I kind of maybe enjoy more. So I'll do more of that. It's, it's always nicer to talk to people who are eager to learn the material than a, you know, a group of people who maybe are coming from zero and you have to maybe try to get over some of that um, initial skepticism. Uh, and right now, there, there's so many people who are uh, hungry and eager to understand Bitcoin. So there's no reason we should spend energy on the other group. You know, let's 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 focus on the ones who want to learn. So um, I, I find it's it's definitely gotten easier. Um, yeah. And is this what you do full time, or um, uh, any other projects that you are involved yep. in? Yeah. So I mean, it varies occasionally if an interesting project comes up uh, where I get to work with you know people I respect. Um, or it'll push me a bit, I'll, I'll do it. Um, you know, I just wrapped up a, a, a project with Bitcoin Magazine where they were redesigning their whole educational section. Um, I'm working on, uh, the problem is with Bitcoin is you can't talk about a lot of the things you're doing because there's so many different, I guess, confidentiality agreements. But uh, yeah, it's just, if you put out good, uh, timeless work, I find um, you get handed a lot of opportunities. I mean, I don't really do any marketing other than Twitter threads, really, and then a few books. So it kind of all stems from that where people say, oh, you know, this particular thing would be great to help this particular audience in this particular country, in this particular context. So it's a whole gambit of, of just different opportunities that, that have been really lucky that have come my way. Um, but that's not to say that's the case from day one. It was very slow going at the start. But if you kind of, you know, work away at something for, for long enough, people understand, oh, this person's pretty committed. Um, you know, they're, they're here for the long term. They're not, they're not a tourist in this sector. So, yeah, that's, 
that's really been the difference, I guess. I think it's easy once you're passionate about Bitcoin. Anyways, you want to read all that you can and research and learn more and more. And then if you have the space and time or this is what you're interested in, then you enjoy it. Uh, you know, uh, teaching others or helping others. And that's what I do. That's what you do. And I think we both know that is absolutely amazing opportunity to, to be able to do this. So totally agree with you. Um, which people um, have been your biggest Bitcoin influencers? Any names you'd care to take? Yeah, oh, so many. Um, I don't know. There's, there's so many smart people in this space. Uh, I'm a big fan of, say, you know, Preston Fish, who does the Investors Podcast. Uh, he has fantastic guests on. I think he's a really good interviewer at, at, at you know, distilling complex things down into, you know, layman's terms for just about anyone to understand. Um, you know, maybe the, the quieter heroes of our space. I, I really respect, you know, Caitlin Long. I think on the um, regulatory side, does incredible work, uh, is not a self-promoter at all. So a lot of the work she does, we don't understand, but we all benefit from. And then, you know, you mentioned the core devs earlier. Um, uh, you, we wouldn't be here without, without them. So um, they're definitely a group I would love to, to, I guess, spend more time with and uh, continue to show more appreciation towards. But uh, yeah, there's just, there's, there's, there's a lot of really good role models I find in the space. Um, sure, there are some maybe questionable ones as well, but if your goal is to become a low time preference, uh, principled, um, you know, person who's who's in it to build community and and with a long time horizon. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of people like that in this space. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think there are so many unsung heroes, and I think the unsung heroes are even bigger personalities or bigger contributors to Bitcoin. I mean, again, my tech co-founder, for example, just is never out there in the open. And he, I think he's contributed so much to Bitcoin and continues to do so. Uh, so totally agree with you. Were you there for the Bitcoin uh, Miami conference? I was not, unfortunately. It's very, uh, I actually just became a father not too long ago. So it was around that time. Um, but it looks like, uh, you know, the culmination of um, sort of years of work uh, it, it looked like a, a really, yeah, good celebration for, for the Bitcoin uh, industry. Yeah. yeah. Did I, you manage to get down there? I no, I'm, I'm in locked borders in Singapore. So for okay. me, the Bitcoin okay. Miami so, conference was FOMO on Twitter every day. Yeah. <laughs> um, mm. what, do you, what do you think about the current uh, state of the market? Uh, what do you think of Bitcoin's price? Do you comment on it? Do you have any price predictions? No, I don't. I, I, I intentionally don't um, because... Those are the uh, sort of people then that I tend to hang out with most and connect with uh, through Twitter by, by not talking about the price and not sort of posting, you know, the, the bull price predictions. You know, you're, you're, you're attracted to a different group perhaps. So, yeah, I, I tend not to talk about price. I don't, don't give financial advice. Um, but I do think it's uh, something that has tremendous upside potential. Um, you know, in the future. And I, I would never suggest someone, you know, spend all of their wealth on acquiring Bitcoin. But I think at this point, it's almost irresponsible not to own some. Absolutely. And your take on altcoins, are you a Bitcoin maximalist? I have seen that you've written about Ethereum uh, a couple of times in the past. Yeah, that would be quite, quite some time ago. Um, I had more of a, a novel exploration, but yeah, in terms of what I guess you know I'm interested in, it's it's really only Bitcoin. In terms of what I would ever suggest anyone um, acquire uh, as part of their portfolio, would only be Bitcoin. And um, that's not to say everything else is garbage. I don't know. I'm, uh, you know, I don't look into anything else because to me this is just such a big deal that it just you know consumes so much of your attention. Um, but I do believe that money trends to one um, and it's a, a winner take all market so if i you know believe bitcoin is sound money and that in the digital age there will be a digital uh sound money i, I do think bitcoin is it and i don't think there's going to be room for for competitors and you reach this conclusion uh, as a full circle or from the beginning i mean did you explore other altcoins and then there was a phase where you were interested in them and thought that they could become something and then you realize that 
no and then you came back or was this the was this your realization from day one no not at all i i'm not that smart um i i look i went down all the same sort of paths of oh uh you know coin x has faster transaction speeds oh okay is that important what trade offs are being made and you know then you sort of ask those second and third layer questions um and then the same thing for okay what about uh programmability or um the range of applications and so yeah i i definitely explored down I, I just out of curiosity never as like a you know investment um what merit there was to other ideas but at the end yeah it kind of just kept leading me back to uh the trade off is too great um the only property that i think is worth looking at is you know indestructibility and bitcoin is just indestructible so if you're going to build something you want to build it on the most solid foundation you can um so that's kind of where it all will let me back to to bitcoin yeah it's surprising that even re- investors whom i respect and are serious investors do not ask the second and the third layer questions on the the first layer questions everything is superficial and you yeah. do not really get the real answers and with other old coins especially I- i'm surprised as well because when you ask them i think i think the conclusions become quite obvious uh, pretty soon um any new products or books projects um uh, that we can look forward to from you anil yeah well uh so I guess yeah so just talking about the the point you just mentioned you know where you you've had probably thousands of conversations with people around bitcoin and if you were to maybe uh categorize those people into the ones who were maybe open minded enough to to sort of push on those questions versus the ones that were oh well you know uh this this particular project's faster or cheaper or whatever um yeah for me it always kind of just came down to ego if if someone had a big ego they were likely to think they had a better solution um or the correct answer and weren't willing to change their their point of view so i i like that over time bitcoin just filters out to become more and more um skeptical but humble people in that you cannot assume you know everything uh ever really um So yeah that that kind of leads into the project I'm working on at the moment which is um just going deeper into the mental models that that people use and applying them to bitcoin. So what are the different lenses that will help you understand bitcoin from different perspectives both the network and the the digitally native asset. Um and yeah I hope to build that out into a, a sort of textbook and then build a online course around that where I'll take people through different different mental models. I love the concept of mental models. I think I've read three books on mental models and then I am really excited to read your book on how the mental models can be used as a lens to understand Bitcoin. Unfortunately, missed reading that book before this podcast because of my typo in the email in the email address, but I will do that today. So, looking forward to that expanded project besides I think the mini book that you've already launched on this uh, topic. Um before we wrap up Anil, how can people find you and your uh, products and services? Yeah, Twitter. Um I think it Twitter has just become this incredible tool uh for me personally but also for the Bitcoin community where it's you know everything from uh meeting people to setting up podcasts like this to uh working with others on projects to investing in projects it's you know Twitter has kind of become this one-stop shop for for all of those things so yeah but you can find me on Twitter you can send me a, a DM if you know there's uh particular questions you have about any of my work um again you know uh, i have free versions on on my twitter account at nil said so of all my work it'll always be there it'll always be free um and i'm always interested in you know meeting meeting bitcoiners who are uh, are interested in learning more and at the same time i'm going to keep learning because that's never never done Yeah absolutely so just again for the audience the twitter uh, profile for anil is anil said so a n i l s a i d s o 
Uh, and absolutely, I mean, this, um, you know, I've been in Bitcoin again for many years. I'm taking your advice and not specifying the number of years, though already it's absolutely public. Uh, and it's, it's just a rabbit hole, which gets actually deeper and deeper, uh, you know, with uh, time. Um, Anil, this show is dedicated to Bitcoiners and I've loved reading your Twitter threads and I'm so happy that finally you agreed to do an episode. Uh, uh, thank you so much. If you uh, like this video podcast, uh, please like and subscribe. Anil, thank you for doing this and thank you for coming on Sunny Bitcoin. Sunny, thanks for, for having me. Uh, it's you know great to finally meet you. And yeah, as, as we sort of chatted about before the uh the recording started is you know i'd been aware of your work uh several several years prior and yeah i respect what what you had done and been doing to, to educate others in in you know a very uh principled way <laughs> you know not not sort of selling uh uh investment upside potential but just saying here's a legitimate technology it'll be in your best interest to understand it um the world will make more sense if you do so <laughs> Yeah, I've always, I've always appreciated your approach to things as well. So, so thank you for what you do. Thank you so much. Uh, Anil, thank you so much for doing this. Anything that you feel like I, I should have covered? Because, of course, I tried to find out. I can now see that you keep a lot of things about yourself private. And that's the reason I'm like, why can't I find more stuff about this guy online? <laughs> <laughs> so now I get it that it's a conscious uh, uh, attempt. Uh, and I, I okay, uh, I thought you said so is your, or said, I don't know, I thought it's an Indian family name. Now I realize it said so. I saw one of those Indian family names, yeah. maybe which I've never come across. But. <laughs> you haven't heard before, yeah. You know, you said so, it's from Gutrav. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. anything that uh, you do that I've covered, which we can still talk about, uh, you would like the audience to know, otherwise we can end this. I no right like nothing comes sensor. to mind i would just say yeah. um yeah just just in terms of it's a really uh exciting time during the bull markets when everything's firing and there's a lot of money sloshing around and startups are getting funded and people are posting huge gains on twitter um that's that's really exciting but at the same time i would say and you know we had just briefly talked about this before as well is it sort of during the bear markets where a lot of the serious work gets done? Uh, a lot of the big long-term opportunities present themselves. Um, it's a great time to make a name for yourself then. So any, you know, uh, early Bitcoiners who really think they'll be in this space for a long time, um, don't worry. There's a huge, a huge span of time ahead of us. And um, yeah, you know, you, you, if there's a bear market ahead, it's, it's just a great time to put your head down, keep learning, keep building. Uh, and I look forward to meeting you. Thank you so much for doing this, buddy. And yeah. you'll be in touch. Yeah, of course, sorry. Great, great to meet you. Reach out as, as needed. And uh, yeah, thanks again for the invite. Super. All right. Cheers, buddy. Yeah. Catch okay. You soon. Take care. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks.